The MPTF Media Center presents the international premiere podcast of Mystery Theater Audibles, Blackfire, a science fiction fantasy novel written and narrated by Anthony Lawrence, directed and produced by Madeline Smith-Lawrence, produced by Jennifer Clymer, sound engineered by Marcus Murrieta. Chapter 3. White light was her first recovering sensation. A light so fierce and uncompromising that it seemed to force itself into her mind rather than into her eyes. Then the pain came that transcended opiates and arched her back with its fury. And all of this came with a non-linear stream of sirens and noise and continuing voices that murmured things she could not understand or even care about. But an image began to form in her mind. The image of Cody struggling to survive inside that mass of tentacles and stinging clutch. Jordan screamed. She screamed again after regaining a kind of tenuous consciousness. It was when they told her her son was dead. They didn't have a chance to even try to comfort her with the knowledge that they did everything they could to restore him. But the antitoxins which saved her had failed to revive that young and more vulnerable child. Jordan thrashed in her hospital bed and continued to scream, unable to comprehend or care about the swollen masses of flesh that were her own. They took her to the funeral in a wheelchair, the swelling still distorting the flesh of her face, hands, and arms. But she felt nothing. Grief loss had left her more numb than any toxin or painkiller ever could. Her landlady was there, and a few close friends from the club. A minister from a nearby church delivered a eulogy which included a poem of Emily Dickinson that was a favorite of Cody's and was quite appropriate. He had recited it over the tiny grave of a pet hamster that had died. As far from pity as complaint, as cool to speech as stone, as numb to revelation as if my trade were bone, as far from time as history, as near yourself today, as children to the rainbow's scarf or sunset's yellow play, to eyelids in the sepulchre, how still the dancer lies, while colors revelations break and blaze the butterflies. Much later, when Jordan had recovered enough of her physical self, she wandered down the halls of the hospital like a benign ghost, dragging the wheeled support and the ever-present hanging IV bottle. Much of the toxic swelling had receded, but the pain of grief and loss remained like a cancer eating away at her spirit. Her only comfort was in denial and sedation or seeking out the slightest distraction of the white world in which she was confined. She would stop at the doorway of patient rooms and stare listlessly in at the various denizens. Some would stare back silently or try to engage her in trifling conversations. She rarely responded in any way, just stood for a moment and then continued on down the corridor. One day, just before being released out into the world by her doctors, Jordan came upon a scene that she seemed to comprehend at some other level. A woman named Elaine Custer had just succumbed to a brain tumor, and her husband Ben was sobbing as the doctor confirmed that his wife had finally lost her terminal battle. Jordan stared in at the tragic scene, her eyes taking in the pale face of the dead woman, tracing the fine features framed by silky amber hair, the perfect nose, the elegant curve of her now purplish and forever silenced lips. It would remain an indelible face because it reminded Jordan of her son's demise and the fact that she had not seen him after death. She had been too traumatized by the event and the doctors had advised against it. So Cody had gone to his grave, his pitiful, tortured body unseen by his mother. Jordan stared in at that woman's face for a long moment trying to recall her child's visage as it had been before. After she was released from the hospital, Jordan spent most of her time sitting staring out the window of her small cottage 
just outside of Sausalito. She had gathered up all of Cody's clothing, toys, and collectibles, sobbing over each item as she caressed them, then pressing them into a large carton which still sat in a corner of the room. The club had given her as much paid time as she needed to recover from her ordeal, but time wasn't the problem and time wasn't going to lessen the pain she felt. Only the deadening of her mind could do that. She quickly used up all the Smirnoff vodka, gin, and bourbon she had in her small liquor cabinet. So she took to visiting the nearby supermarket where she could pick up new stores of booze and paper bag her way back into oblivion. Neutralizing some of the pain, she was eventually able to get back on her Harley and frequent the go-to bars and watering holes on the side streets of Sausalito in San Francisco. Staying in her apartment and looking at the reminders of Cody's recent presence, which she could neither dispose of nor keep, had no longer even become an option. It was simply impossible and she had to get out, be alone, and become numb as much as she needed, when she needed. She wasn't interested in any of the popular bar scenes, that happy hour specials, pool tables, and theme nights. She didn't even hear any of the karaoke singers recharging their inner American idol. She just wanted to be left alone. But one night, when she was getting quietly wasted at the bar of one of the many dives, Stephen Glenn Weber, a young man in his 30s, approached her. He wasn't the first man to try and pick Jordan up as she flowed from bar to bar in the late nights. She had managed to send them all off irritated, frustrated, or even physically damaged. There was only one thing she was interested in, and it didn't wear pants and make stupid and inane attempts to get her into bed. It came in a bottle, and it didn't ask questions and provided only one answer. But Stephen Glenn Weber was more persistent. He was an attractive man with that dangerous quality that had always interested Jordan before. Piercing dark eyes and thick eyebrows, wavy black hair and a tough, strong body with plenty of tats would have at least gotten a measure of her attention before, but now she hardly even saw him or heard his voice. She had been drinking heavily for a couple of hours before he arrived, and while she was still able to communicate her disinterest, it was faltering because she was simply too fucked up to put up her usual impenetrable defenses. An aggressive young man, Stephen Glenn Weber's advances overwhelmed Jordan along with the booze she had consumed. She was hardly even aware of being manipulated out of the bar and into his car. Not long after, she was slipping in and out of consciousness as he half carried her into his motel room along a busy highway. Jordan could only moan and put up slight objections as the man roughly stripped her of her clothing, then his own, and shoved her onto the coarse surface of the queen-sized motel bed. Stephen Glenn Weber knew what he wanted and had drunk just enough alcohol to make his desires ruthlessly impetuous and relentless. Jordan's naked white body with its sensual curves and soft skin was irresistible to the raging libido of her ravager, but he was becoming increasingly frustrated by her total inability to participate in the coupling. Jordan was not completely unconscious, but simply paralyzed by the effects of the drinks she had consumed. Somewhere in her mind, she could hear the grunts and labored breathing of the persistent rapist, but she could do nothing to prevent his aggression. Somewhere in her mind, she could feel the heavy presence of his powerful body pressing down on her, the smell of his foul breath, and even the violation of her body by his fingers, his vicious tongue and his vile jerking and failed attempts to insert his thrusting erection. Stephen Glenn Weber began to slap her face, shake her body, and scream at her, Wake up, you fucking bitch! But Jordan remained limp, impassive, and unable to function in a more pleasurable way that would suit his desires. Unable to penetrate her to his satisfaction, the frustrated man scooped her body up in his arms and carried her quickly into the bathroom. He shoved her brutally into the shower and turned the water on full force as she crumpled into a corner. The cold water not only brought Jordan's consciousness to the surface, but also shocked her memory into a horrifying replay of an event that had changed her life forever. The sharp streams of water coming from the showerhead were like the electric shock stings of that quivering mass that was killing her son in the waters of the Pacific. Once again, she was being enveloped by those toxic mucous membranes that had attacked Cody. Once again, she was clawing at the venomous tentacles that were wrapping themselves around her body and sending waves of excruciating pain into every fiber of her being. 
Jordan exploded in sudden violent resistance and hysteria, striking out and tearing at Stephen Glenn Weber's face and body, startling him and causing him to fall heavily and painfully onto the bathroom tile floor. Infuriated, Weber lunged at the screaming girl and was about to slam his fist into her face when he reacted to a sudden pounding at the motel door. Instantly, he whirled away from Jordan, charged out of the bathroom, and as a voice yelled from outside that it was the FBI and that he should open the door, Weber grabbed a Colt 45 revolver from a drawer and started to level it at the door. But the door burst open in that instant and men slammed into the room, their own weapons leveled at Weber. Bullets ripped into his chest, slamming him backward into the floor. Still conscious, he attempted to fire at the FBI agents. But another volley of rounds silenced both his gun and his existence. Chapter 4 Yeah, we cut that fucker down, put him away for good. We heard her screaming from a block away and we came hard and fast. I didn't know why she was screaming like that at the time. I've heard women scream who are about to be raped, but this didn't seem to be the result of being sexually violated, at least not in the way we have come to know the abuse of women. The scream was from some hellish nightmare that she had survived before she ever met Stephen Glenn Weber. It was a lot like my own nightmare, like what the army now calls post-traumatic stress disorder. But anyway, I held her in my arms and she screamed until the medics put her out and took her to the hospital. I went to see her the first thing in the morning and I was there when she woke up. I was sitting in a chair next to her bed wearing my standard bureau attire. I smiled at her quietly and gently, introduced myself as Rafe Dillon, a special agent with the FBI. Yeah, the same guy roasting to death out in the Mojave Desert is a fucking intelligence officer. I grew up in the projects of Beantown, hub of the universe, cradle of modern America. I'm talking Boston, New England, home of Fenway Park and the Red Sox. It's, it's a real Irish town. Both my mom and dad worked, so I was bounced around from relatives to a bunch of crummy foster homes, a military academy, and a Catholic school for wayward boys. That's where I met my first devil. Father John Matus came on all kind and tough at the same time, but underneath was the sort of slime you can't find in the worst sewer. Do I, do I have to go on with this? Can't I just keep hiding it in the darkest recesses of my mind where it can't do any more harm? I don't seem able to do that somehow. It just keeps popping up like a hunk of cork in dirty water. You can't keep it down no matter how hard you try. There's just something in the nature of it that wants to come up into the sunlight and get clean after being down in the dark bowels of the muck. Okay, so here goes. Good old Father Matus was a fucking coddling, abusive priest. There, I've said it. It's out now. Can't stop it now if I wanted to. Yeah. It started in middle school, where I was struggling to keep up because we moved around so much. I was behind in every class, vulnerable, just wanted someone to care about me. That quality gave me a huge fucking target right on my back for some middle-aged religious zealot pedophile shitbag to gain my confidence and rip off my innocence. Well, they told me later that Father Matus agreed to accept his appointment as bishop only after I promised never to reveal the nature of our relationship. Fucking bastard became bishop even while still abusing me on camping trips. The school and the church tried to cover it all up, but a state police detective assigned to the district attorney's office dug into my case and prosecuted Matus, who was also a suspect in the slaying of a 13-year-old Boston altar boy. But despite the evidence, the church did not move to defrock him. And like most of the allegations against priests that have surfaced since the clergy sexual abuse scandals exploded in January 2002, those leveled against Matus fell outside the statute of limitations, and he was set free. 
Oh, well, I, I tried to put it all behind me as I grew older. Actually, I just, I just wanted to bury it in the back of my mind somewhere in the dark graveyard of rotten little secrets that we all have but won't admit to. No matter how hard I tried, I, I couldn't get that bastard out of my head, and I swore to myself that someday, oh, someday I would pay him back for my lost childhood. Well, I went on to join the Boston Police Department. I tried to convince myself that it was because of the detective who dug up evidence to convict Father Matusen, save what was left of my sanity in my life, but it was really because the priest had disappeared, and I was determined to find him. Oh, I would find him if it took the rest of my life. I would find him, and I would make him pay. I spent a few years in BPD using their files and technology in an attempt to locate Father Matus. But when I learned that he had been relocated by the church and they refused to reveal it, I joined the FBI and became a special agent, using the case of the slain altar boy as a means to continue the search for Father Matus. It had become an obsession. As a member of Boston's FBI division, I'd learned from written communications and records there was good reason to believe the priest, Matus, had recently been on the West Coast. I had been warned numerous times before by supervisors about my personal involvement in the long-closed file on the priest, but I had assured them repeatedly that I was no longer pursuing him, a lie, and I was granted my request to transfer to San Francisco. But once there, I joined up with other agents in the quest to locate and capture a most wanted perpetrator. Stephen Glenn Weber, who had been seen in and around the Northern California city. Field agents had been closing in on Weber when they had gotten the report from local authorities that Weber had been spotted in Sausalito. I put off my hunt for Matus long enough to go with the other field agents and move in on the motel where we learned Weber had holed up. We felt we had no choice when we battered in the motel room door and Weber had leveled his gun at us. We had to take him down and Weber quickly was removed from the most wanted list. Now Jordan stared at me for a long moment, trying to figure out what the hell had happened to her and why an agent of the FBI would be here with her in a hospital room. I tried to be as calming and reassuring as I could be. The sources of her pain were different from mine, but the quality of the pain we both felt must have been pretty much the same. I reassured her that she wasn't in any kind of trouble, that I knew who she was, and exactly how she came to be in the motel room with the man who had been a complete stranger to her. It was my business to know about people, and from her identification, it was not too difficult to trace her movements and involvement with Stephen Glenn Weber. The FBI had been on his trail for some time. Weber was being sought for his escape from Folsom State Prison, where he was serving a lengthy sentence for murder. I told her he had allegedly shot and killed an armored car guard in Arizona and was one of their most wanted fugitives. We had tracked him over several states, cities, and towns. Witnesses had already revealed that Jordan had been drinking somewhat heavily as a result of the death of her son, and that she appeared to have been picked up by Weber. Concerned about her, the bartender had notified the police, and based on Weber's high-profile description, the FBI was contacted. It would only be necessary for her to answer a few questions so that I could file a report. All she needed to do now was to recover from her ordeal, and I would contact her soon. Preparing to leave, I told her that I was very sorry about her son and understood why she was trying to drown the pain. Jordan began to cry at the mention of Cody's death, and I quickly tried to comfort her. I couldn't really soften the pain in any real sense. She told me later that she had endured a couple of bad relationships that had preceded her involvement with the crackhead poker champion. Then came her son's death, and she was simply no longer capable of any feelings other than bitterness and grief. I recognized her deep pain for no other reason than that which I felt so intensely myself. For the moment, I touched her gently and then left the hospital room somehow knowing I wanted to see her again for more reasons than justifiable report. I did see Jordan again, and soon. Her Harley had been found by police at the bar where Jordan had encountered Stephen Glenn Weber. It had been impounded for a short time, and then I pulled some strings and managed to retrieve it for her. Besides her obvious beauty and intelligence, there was something about this lost soul that really got to me. 
I knew that the pain she was feeling reminded me of my own. There appeared to be even more to it. I sensed she was right on the edge of life like it was some sort of cliff, and she was at risk of falling, but wanted to be saved. Even though she seemed to be withdrawn into grief and disinterested in me, I could tell that she liked me more than she was willing to admit. I took her to dinner a couple of times and tried to draw her out to get her to talk about her life, about Cody, but she continued to be resistant in giving me mixed messages. She wanted me to leave her alone, yet she continued to accept my invitations as if she knew somehow that I just might be able to restore her. I could tell she was attracted to me, but it was obvious that she still just couldn't quite bring herself to trust me. There had been a long line of men she had trusted, going all the way back to her father. They had all let her down, and losing Cody just seemed to be more of the bitter side of life than she could bear. Then, one night, about a week after we had first met, I had brought her to my hotel room. Okay, maybe I was pushing things a little too soon for her and for myself, but I, I couldn't help it. I'd never met anybody like her before, and I wasn't sure just how long I might be here. I wanted to hold her in my arms. I wanted to make love to her. Just like every other self-centered male, I wasn't willing to wait for anything. I even pushed out of my mind the difficulties I'd had before with other women. I was always living in a kind of denial, hoping the one would come along who would make a difference. I was hoping that now. She could have said no, but she didn't. So here we were, hungry for a dinner of lemon pepper chicken, steamed vegetable, tortellini pasta, and tossed salad. It sounded good to both of us, but my surprise for Jordan was that I wasn't going to order it for room service. I was going to cook it in our hotel room. Lots of agents found themselves stuck in hotels for days or weeks on assignments. The novelty of eating every meal at a restaurant soon wore off, so I learned that many in-room resources were capable of facilitating cooking. Sure, it was, it was illegal, but who the fuck was going to arrest me? I placed the foil-wrapped chicken on the ironing board, put the iron on its highest level, and put it over the top for four or five minutes. Then I steamed the mushrooms, peas, and carrots in the coffee maker. I had to run the water through a couple of times to achieve the desired tenderness, but that gave me time to boil the tortellini in the electric tea kettle and use the ice bucket to toss the salad. Although it didn't taste five star, Jordan was more than impressed by the dinner and the fact that I didn't burn down the hotel room. When we finished eating, I commented that it was the first time since I'd met her that I'd seen a real smile on her face. She shrugged smiled again, and it was the first home-cooked meal she'd had in some time. She was grateful. I touched her hand gently, felt the smooth skin. She didn't pull away. I confessed that I was feeling better than I had in a long time. Moments later, I took her in my arms and kissed her. It was a soft, tentative kiss at first, and then our bodies and our mouths deepened the kiss and aroused the need and passion for each other. My hands caressed her body slowly, and she responded with her own touching and feeling that mounted quickly into the stripping of clothing and the sinking down to the heavy shag carpeting. My kisses moved from her mouth to her cheeks and then to her neck and shoulders as her blouse came down. Then I scooped her up bodily and gently moved her to the bed, sliding down on top of her while her arms came up around me, pressing me to her. But no matter how hard I tried, even though I was so stimulated by her and wanted to make love to her, I simply couldn't. It was just like all the other times before. Frustrated and filled with self-loathing, I simply stopped trying. After a few moments, she touched my face tenderly with her hand and asked somewhat plaintively, Is it my fault? Is it because of me? She thought wrongfully that somehow she was not sufficiently arousing me and that it had something to do with what had happened to her when we first met, but I reassured her that it had nothing to do with her, made some feeble excuses about being tired, and I kissed her warmly and began stroking her long, soft hair until she fell asleep. I was devastated like so many times before. I felt humiliated, and the anger and hate I held for that priest of my childhood swept over me, and I knew I would spend another sleepless night.
Chapter 5 When Jordan awakened in the morning, Rafe was gone. All that was left of him was a note that he had left on her pillow. Jordan, I hope you can forgive me for leaving like this. I got a call during the night and didn't want to wake you to say goodbye. It would have been painful for both of us. I didn't tell you, but there's a man I have been chasing for a long time. I received information about where I can find him, so I had to leave immediately for the Virgin Valley in Nevada. Believe me, this is extremely important to me, or I never would have walked out on you. The hotel bill is paid. I do care about you, and I will find you again. That's a promise. Rafe. Jordan slowly crumpled the note and shoved it into her purse. She dressed and left the hotel room, mounted her Harley, and headed back to her apartment. An hour later, she was sitting in the middle of her living room, surrounded by all of Cody's clothes and toys. She had taken them out of the storage carton, touched all of them with love and painful remembrance. Then she slowly placed them back into the carton, closed it up, and put it back into her closet. She felt once again the total desolation of her loss. But there was an added feeling now, an overwhelming sense that she had been a fool once again when it came to men. It was late night when Jordan drove her Harley Sportster up to the remotely controlled security gate on the Sausalito side of the Golden Gate Bridge. She knew that the bridge was closed to pedestrians at night, but that cyclists were still permitted across. They must, however, be buzzed in and out through the gates. The deck of the Golden Gate Bridge is approximately 245 feet above the water. Despite its red appearance, the color of the bridge is officially an orange vermilion called International Orange. Currents beneath the bridge are very strong, and the water may be as cold as 47 degrees Fahrenheit. Jordan had driven through the heavy nighttime fog, past suicide hotline telephones, and signs meant to deter potential jumpers. Crisis counseling. There is hope. Make the call. The consequences of jumping from this bridge are fatal and tragic. Jordan had done her homework, and she knew the history of the bridge and its record of suicide over the years. By 2005, the count exceeded 1,200, and new suicides were averaging one every two weeks. This was the official suicide count, but there was no real accurate count because many were not witnessed. Currents in the water were very strong, and some jumpers were undoubtedly washed out to sea without ever being seen. But there was little doubt about the impact of hitting the water from such a height. Some jumpers had survived, but it was very rare. After a fall of approximately four seconds, jumpers hit the water at some 76 miles per hour. At such a speed, water has been determined to take on properties similar to concrete. Jordan was buzzed through the remote-controlled gate and swiftly drove her bike past some staff patrolling the bridge in carts, obviously looking for people who appear to be planning to jump. She knew there might also be iron workers on the bridge who volunteer their time to prevent suicides by talking or wrestling down suicidal people. Once she arrived at near the center of the bridge and totally immersed and hidden by the thick fog, Jordan pulled her Harley over to the side of the structure's highway lane. She got off the cycle and quickly moved to the low barrier railing. There was no turning back for her now. She had been thinking and preparing for this quite some time. The plan had been interrupted only briefly by her encounter with Rafe. She knew now that the experience only further reinforced her desire to end her life. She had somehow falsely thought that she could manage to forget about Cody by throwing herself into a relationship with him. Unfortunately, he walked out on her bringing her back to her senses, knowing now that nothing in the world could ever ease the pain and that she was definitely at the end of her rope. Straddling the barrier, Jordan glanced downward toward the dense fog that covered the surface of the ocean. She slid off her helmet, looked at it for a moment, and then dropped it down through the fog. There was a long moment as she listened for the splash. If it did occur, she couldn't hear it. She could only hear the wind and feel it as it whipped through her long hair. She was frightened at the prospect of hurling herself downward. She fought the fear as she fought against the thoughts that might justify delay or cancellation. She deserved the ending and the silence, the eternal dark rest from pain and grief and self-loathing. 
She had long felt the overwhelming guilt of not having watched Cody carefully enough. And the torture of that one feeling was enough to demand an end to the constant self-reproach. But she couldn't help thinking in this last moment whether death might actually be the end of existence. Maybe there might really be something else, and she might see Cody again. That thought was comforting, but she didn't really believe it. She felt that she had no existence before she was born, and she would have no existence after she left this world. Nothing else seemed real or logical to her. Religion had never been a part of her life, and it was not there now to provide peace of mind. In fact, she thought nothingness would be preferable, because in the darkness of pure void, there would be no thought or guilt. It would be the bliss of sleep without dreams. She gathered herself together to make the plunge. Chapter 6 It was about 2 a.m. when I had gotten the call on my cell phone from Bert Cannell. I think I knew what had prompted him to call me at this time of the night. It could only be one thing. Bert was my best friend and a cryptanalysis agent in the Forensic Analysis and Operational Support Field branch of the Reno, Nevada FBI. We had met at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, where we had been selected for training to become new field agents. Neither of us had a fucking clue what we were getting ourselves into, but neither did the FBI. Bert had grown up on the south side of Chicago in a dangerous and tough area known as Englewood. In the early 1990s, every police officer was white and every citizen was African American. This made Bert a man of simple beginnings and complicated teen years. Like so many other kids in his neighborhood, he had a, a love for things that he couldn't afford and a determination to get them anyway. It landed him in jail only once, and it was there he decided on a different direction for his life. Perhaps it was the determination of this hard-nosed kid to fulfill that dream that slipped through his father's grasp. But Burke quickly worked his way up the ranks of the Chicago PD and made it known that he had even higher aspirations. Bert and I became fast friends at Quantico. Maybe it was our similarities, maybe it was our differences, and maybe we both just needed a friend. No matter the reasons, we took most of our courses together. Uh, I loved Bert better than I could have ever loved a real live brother. I could never have told him that, but I knew he had felt the same way. The phone had vibrated me awake and I moved to the bathroom so as not to disturb Jordan, who was still fast asleep in bed. Bert warned me that he would be going outside of regulations if he continued to aid me in my personal vendetta against Father Matus. Although he was putting his own career at risk by providing information to me about the priest, he knew the history and was willing to help. He just had to give me one last warning about endangering my own career by going rogue. But Bert could tell from the sound of my voice that there was no turning back. The old wound could never be healed unless I either brought Father Matus to justice or provided that justice personally. There was no other option. He had emasculated me. He had been the cause of my humiliation with Jordan earlier. I dreaded facing her in the morning. I had to leave, go after the man who had pretty much destroyed my life. So, Bert provided the data and information that he had promised since we had touched base weeks ago. According to the data, the priest had been transferred from a remote diocese in northern Italy, brought back to the U.S. several months ago to a small parish in a desert town called Watson in the Virgin Valley of northern Nevada. Moments after the call, I'd written down the information and then used the same ballpoint pen to write the note to Jordan. Shortly after, I silently left the motel, got into my car and drove off into the night, heading southeast toward Nevada. There had been just a moment in that motel after the call when I really wanted to awaken Jordan, to reassure her that I cared about her and that I'd be coming back to find her. Not only had I never met anyone as beautiful and desirable, but also I felt drawn to her because of her obvious deep despair. It matched my own in some secret inner way. Only mine was still there after many years, while hers was more recent. But I knew if I'd awakened her, held her in my arms for even just a few seconds, I'd never be able to leave. And I had to leave. I had to find Father Matus if I ever wanted to put the pieces of my life back together.
Chapter 7. Before Jordan could jump from the Golden Gate Bridge, she heard a sound from far below, and as the fog became less dense, she began to make out the black ocean surface becoming slowly illuminated by the running lights of a small boat. It was moving through the strong currents toward the marina. Jordan tensed her body for the leap, pushing herself farther out, her eyes still fixed on the water below. But suddenly, she froze as she stared down at the surface. There seemed to be a series of pulsing green and white umbrella-shaped entities floating in the dark waters and covering a large area. Was she imagining it? No. The swarm was there, almost like it was waiting for her. How could that be possible? Maybe it was just coincidence. But she had forgotten all about what was in the water when she had considered the popular leap as her method of leaving this world. Could it even be the same bloom of jellyfish that killed her son? It must be an hallucination, she thought. Some quirk of mind that adrenaline was pumping into her and creating because of her purpose. But whatever it was, it terrified her because of what she remembered. What had killed Cody and nearly killed her, she could only stare down in horror as layers of cells from the sub-umbrella bottom surfaces seemed to be curling upward and forming a series of circular nerve rings in the swirling fog. She screamed as she lurched back away from the terrifying illusion that appeared to be forming into a dark, malevolent face with eyes that burned with evil. Please don't jump. The sound of the calm, natural voice behind Jordan jarred her, and the illusion below mysteriously disappeared as quickly as it had formed. She clutched at the barrier and turned slowly to see a staff patrolman standing next to his car nearby. Fog swirled around him like a dark mantle. His name was Anderson Jeffers, a stocky man of 50 with a tough but kind face. What's your name? he asked gently. Jordan rubbed her eyes, shook her head to erase the vision she had seen, and then regarded him narrowly, her body trembling. Look, I know all the psychology bullshit and it won't work. I'm jumping. I just can't deal with it anymore. Well, it's why I'm here, miss, but I'm not a psychologist. I'm a bridge patrol officer. Jordan was hanging on, but determination was still in her face despite the harrowing things she had seen below her. At least tell me your name, the officer asked. Look, I gotta fill out a report, okay? None of your damn business, responded Jordan, looking for the courage to just jump and end her suffering once and for all. The bridge patrol officer could see it in her eyes, not wanting to push her any further. He then inched a little closer to Jordan, non-threatening but deliberate, just in case he had to leap and grab her at the last second. The officer was running out of options, so he tried to do what he had done every other time someone was going to leap to their death. Bring them back to cold reality. He told her she didn't know what she was doing, that it was a 25-story drop from there that would shatter her ribs and vertebrae like glass. It was a permanent solution to a temporary problem, and it was going to be disgusting. Just leave me alone. I'm going to jump. If you come any closer, it will be sooner than later. The patrol officer knew he had very little time left to save Jordan. She was shaken, confused, slowly letting go of the railing with every moment that passed. Jordan's fear gave way to resolve as she started to jump, yet something prevented her again. But it wasn't anything down below in the ocean, nor was it the man on the bridge. It was something and someone else, a car that slowed down, a racing green jaguar, the two people inside staring out the window to see what was happening. The sight of those two people shocked Jordan in a way that she could not have imagined. The face of the woman on the passenger side was illuminated by light from a nearby lamppost that burned through the fog. The officer saw the look in Jordan's eyes and followed her glance regarding the woman in the Jaguar. Jordan could never forget that face. She had seen the woman in the hospital while recovering from the stings of the jellyfish. Her name was Elaine Custer. Jordan remembered the fine features and silky amber hair, the perfect nose and elegant purplish curve of the mouth. The woman had died of cancer. The woman was dead. 
her skin white as chalk, yet here she was looking out of a car window at Jordan. She was alive and well. The man with her was Ben, the woman's husband, whom Jordan had seen crumpled over his wife's body in abject grief. Now he was driving her across the Golden Gate Bridge. Jordan felt she must have been going mad. She had seen a horrible illusion below her, and now she was staring into the face of a woman she had seen dead. Or was it just another illusion? It didn't make sense. Nothing was making any sense. Maybe she had made a mistake, just like with the jellyfish. Maybe the shock of just facing that leap into the darkness had caused her to have these delusions. But as she stared at Elaine Custer and the Jaguar that was driving off, Jordan knew she had to find out the truth. That face was so imprinted in her mind, it could not be a mistake. She just couldn't make the jump now, not knowing. She simply couldn't go to her death, not knowing. She could come back to jump another night, but she might never know if it was the same woman if she didn't find out now, in this instant, with this chance. Jordan swiftly climbed off the barrier, ignoring the confused patrolman Jeffers, who was still standing nearby and quickly mounted her Harley. She started it up and screeched off into the night, following the racing green jaguar she had seen carrying Elaine and her husband. <laughs>